OK. So I assigned, created and assigned problem set seven. Uh, because I did it so late, I did it on Saturday. Um, I'm making it due on Friday rather than on Wednesday. It's all about light and glass and things like that that are associated with the sunlight section. So I've talked about everything you need to know to, to answer the questions on that problem set. With maybe one exception, and it's a demonstration that I had up here last time and naturally forgot to show you. And over here on the, on the right screen, you are looking through this camera, hi, um, at this pool of salad oil. And you can see the outside of the salad. You, you can, well, you can see various things. You can see yourselves in it, of course, and reflections off the surface of the glass. And the point of this is Pyrex glass, borosilicate glass, Pyrex Kymax, the kitchen glass. Uh, it's a special glass made because it has a relatively small change in size with temperature. And it's therefore relatively resistant to shattering when you change its temperatures up and down and don't get everything perfectly uniform. So cooking glass, special, you know, it's a, okay, it's a specialty glass. Uh, shows up in the chemistry lab, my lab, all, all over the place. In any case, it has the same index of refraction as salad oil. So they're both about 1.5 something. And that means that, that light slows down the same amount in going into, from air into salad oil as for going from air into Pyrex glass. And, and out the other end, the same, same effect. So what do you think will happen when I put a Pyrex glass object into the salad oil? What will you see? Will you see reflections? How many think that you'll see reflections? How many think you won't see reflections? Ooh, yes, you are right. And uh, how about bending of light? Refraction. How many think you'll see refraction? How many th think you won't see refraction? Right. So if you put, put one of these guys in, so here's one with, it, can you show it? it's got some, some labeling on it and stuff. If I put it in, Should basically disappear. It's almost invisible, except not quite perfect. The stuff is just sort of floating there. The labeling is just kind of floating there. This guy's got no labeling. It just mostly disappears. And this piece of plastic, so there's there's the plastic. It's actually got some cloudiness to it when you put it in. it pretty much disappears too. OK? So they can use, people use this kind of technique to identify certain gemstones. Or, I mean, I think they use it for that. If you take a gemstone that you know has a certain index of refraction and a fluid that has the same index of refraction, the gemstone should disappear apart from any color that's intrinsic to the gemstone. So if, you know, a diamond immersed in a fluid with the same index of refraction as diamond Assuming it's a colorless diamond, it will become an invisible in entering that fluid. So you can, so you can test to see whether it's real or not. All right. You understand why that disappeared? Any, we're OK with that? No change in light speed in entering or exiting that. So it basically disappears. All right. I'll come back to normal. All right. So where I left off with with uh, talking about discharge lamps is the in an introduction to quantum physics. And it's a whole broad territory. It's, it's mostly old physics in the sense that, that we've known about it for 100 years. It's, it's so well developed that it's, people still do study quantum mechanics, but they're relatively rare. And, it's, and basically, it's, it's a tool that most physicists simply use. So what are some of the most important ideas in it? Um, up until the advent of, of, of quantum physics, people thought the world of, of stuff divided neatly into objects that are really particle-like, like electrons and billiard balls and people, and, ob and, and, and stuff that was wave-like, like sound and light and uh, other vibration-y things. It turned out that that distinction is not as sharp as we thought it was, or people thought it was in the about 1900. 
it's kind of fuzzy. And it turns out that everything has both wave-like character and particle-like character. And in certain contexts, you see one mostly wave-like, or in certain other contexts, you see mostly particle-like. The general rule of thumb is that when you go looking for something, you tend to draw out its particle-like character. If you go looking for where is a, an electron located, you'll, you'll sort of pin it down and make it a particle-like thing. Uh, if you create or, or destroy something, and so the act of really being engaging with it tends to make it particle-like. On the other hand, if you just let it move, let's just let it be and go and do its thing, it tends to be more mostly wave-like. So uh, light traveling from the sun to the earth is certainly quite wave-like on, on route, but so is an electron traveling. Uh, part of the solar wind is, consists of a lot of charged particles. They're whizzing from the sun to the earth and, and, and beyond. They're traveling pretty much wave-like as, as they cook along, and nobody's paying much attention to them. So um, you end up seeing both characters in, in everything. Uh, I, I mentioned last time that the ex some of the classic experiments that discovered the, the other character in something that it thought to, be, to have been one or only one. Uh, the case for electrons, which up until that point, only relatively recently discovered, were thought to be particles. But in fact, they have a wave-like character. If you send them off of, uh, you know, through a crystal and allow them to reflect, it's just like you sent them off a, off a soap film. It's related to that. You get interference effects, which are strictly a wave-like, a, a wave phenomena. If you, basically, if you chop up a wave into lots of pieces and then re-overlap them, the pieces, and you get interferences that are constructive and destructive, where the wave, if the wave's in phase, it, you get constructive. If the, wave, the, wa the pieces of wave are out of phase, you get destructive interference. That was thought to be like only for, for things like light and sound. But no, it shows up for electrons. So that was a, the proof that electrons have wave-like character and subsequently everything. You know, there's lots of wave-like character in so-called particles. Uh, how about for light, which was thought entirely to be a wave-like thingy? The, the, the so-called photoelectric effect was, was the, the, I don't know, it was the nail in the coffin, but it was the, ob the observation that, whoa, light has a particle-like character. And it's actually a pretty important one by itself, that when, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll repeat myself from last time a little, that if light were strictly a wave, nothing else, just an electromagnetic wave, you would expect that as you turn up the intensity of the light, and therefore made its electric field stronger and stronger, that if you shine it on a surface, that field can get strong enough to start throwing charged particles out of the surface. And those charged particles should come out pushed harder and harder and be moving faster and faster as you turn up the intensity of the light. That was the expectation. Crank it up and pff, you, you pop up big whopping high energy electrons. In real, reality, that's not what happens at all. Instead, you end up with electrons that come out that depend only on the wavelength of the light, or actually on the frequency of the light. The higher the frequency of the light, the faster the, some of the electrons come off, the more energy they carry with them. There seems to be a relationship between the frequency of the light, not its intensity, not how bright it is, but, but, its, but its color, and um, how energetic the electrons come off with. And explaining that, I, I mentioned last time, was, was ultimately uh, Einstein had four, four papers in 1905, uh, each one of which was just earth-shaking. Um, relative, special relativity was one of them, but uh, the photoelectric effect explanation was another, and that's, that's the one he got a, a Nobel Prize for. Okay, so what, what, that, what that observation says is that, that light, as much as it has wave-like character that was known as Newton knew about light's wave-like character, it also has a particulate character. It's absorbed and emitted as particles. So I told you again that, that all things in nature are at their most particle-like when you, when you go looking for them, when you create them, when you destroy them. That's really when they show their, their particle-like character. And that's certainly true of, of light. When you create a particle, well, create a particle light, when you create a, the smallest little piece, of, a quantum it's called, a quantum, quantum of light, uh, it's very particle-like. It then travels as a wave. When you go looking for it to collect it, it's very particle-like again. 
So it carries a little packet of a certain amount of energy. Amazingly enough, the energy has to do with only one thing, its frequency. The frequency of the light determines the energy in the packet. Um, so any questions or thoughts at this point? I mean, it's all wacky doodle stuff, but it's, alas, it is the way the world works. Um, some, some discussion then about uh, the idea of, what, so what's the wave-like character of an electron? Well, if you just leave an electron alone and have it, have it uh, be as motionless as it possibly can, you have, to actually, you have to confine it a little bit, otherwise it will, it will move. Um, but if you, if you put a box around it, let's make it, to, for simplicity, make a spherical box around it, let it get it settled, as little energy as it possibly can, and as motionless as it can, it will actually fill that sphere with a wave. The wave will actually ha have its strongest aspect in the middle of the sphere, and will peter out on the walls. Is this right? Oh, I should be careful. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, it depends on what, I, what the box is, you know, how I'm confining it. It's, it's more complicated, but I, I, I want to have it have that, that wave-like character. And once we've done that, we don't really know where the electron is very well. Its particle-like character is really suppressed. It's somewhere in the box. Uh, we have, there are, you can have statistics about where it is in the box, given that it's, it, if, it, if it's allowed to, to give up as much energy as possible, it will tend to be more towards the center of the box than the edges. But you don't know where it is. So the particle-like is really, really under, not, not so good. You don't know where, where to look. But its wave-like character is, is very ni nice and clean and settled. Has no, it has no momentum. Very, very simple. Uh, if, however, you go in there and you, you decide you want to look, where is it? And you go make a measurement and find it's in this little tiny region within that big sphere, you will have changed the wave in doing that. Because now the wave re represented, among other things, the likelihood you would find the particle at, at various locations. Uh, the wave is strongest where you're most likely to find it if you do go look for it. It's weakest where you won't find it in all likelihood. If you go and say for sure it's here, the, the wave is nothing, is zero all out here. You, you, you destroyed that possibility. So it, 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 people talk about collapsing the wave function. You have, you have edited out all of the wave except for the part that's in your little region you went looking for. And the wave is now quite different. It is a highly localized wave. It's much more particle-like than it used to be. You kind of say it's there, not in this big, fuzzy, diffuse possibility range. It's there. The consequence of having pinned it down like that, though, so that you know its location relatively well, is you lose control over its momentum. And it's not just that you don't know the momentum well. It's that it's not defined very well anymore. The momentum then becomes very, very uncertain. This is the famous uncertainty principle. You, you, there are certain. Uh, physical quantities that, that uh, form pairs that you can't know simultaneously to arbitrary precision. Like if you know where the particle, where, where the thingy is located super, super well, you can't know its momentum well. That, there's an uncertainty relationship between those two. Uh, if you know an object's energy, you can't know its, its place in time very well either. Uh, those are, those are uh, how can I give you an example of that? Uh, nothing comes off. Uh, I, I can't give you a simple example off the top of my head on that one. But, but pin, anyway, returning to this, you pin it down in space, you lose control of its momentum. You go and very accurately determine how the momentum of the electron, you go and watch the wave go by. The, the characteristics of the wave determine how, what, what its momentum is. And if you go and very carefully measure its momentum, you, you measure for a long period of of, of time and space, and you lose track of where the particle is over, except to, to very rough, you know, somewhere in this room. I know it's momentum really well, but I have no idea really where it's located. You, you can't get both at once, and it's not a matter just of not being able to make the measurement. It's that, that nature doesn't define some things the way we used to think it did, where you could simultaneously have something where you knew exactly where it was, and you knew exactly what momentum it had. That classical physics notion just isn't quite correct. And the, the failure of the, de of, the, of the pair to have a well-defined value uh, th becomes more noticeable as things get smaller. As you're dealing with, with, with tinier masses, 
Um, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty hard to see in, in our ordinary everyday world. We're too big. The masses are too big. You could have a well-defined position and a well-defined momentum to within the limits of quantum mechanics, and no one would notice that there's a sort of a, a slight fuzziness to both of those values. Because it's a fuzziness, you know, for an electron, it might be, it might be a, a fuzziness of a factor of two. For a person, it might be a fuzziness by a factor of a thousand thousandth of a thousandth of a thousandth of a thousandth. Tiny, tiny overall uncertainty. All right, so everything's got a wave-like character, particle-like character. You tend to see the wave-like when things are traveling or left alone. You tend to see the particle-like when you go looking at stuff. Uh, anything else? Anything that, 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 that you wonder around, wonder about? That I can try to... All right, well, so about, about the wave-like character of an electron and an atom, to try to lead into this, and this is my, my drawing I was hand-waving about last time, let me, let me try again. If you have a guitar string or violin string and you pluck it, it's, it is a one-dimensional object from left to right, and it carries a wave on it. It's a standing wave. That is a, a wave that doesn't actually go anywhere. It stays trapped between these two ends. It's a wave that dances there in place, and the waving, the wave character to it takes place into a second dimension just so you can sort of see it. Right, the string goes up and down or back and forth. That's, that's the amplitude of the wave is, is into this, this second direction. But really, the, the wave takes place along a one-dimensional string left to right. So it's a one-dimensional wave. Is that OK? The, the, the vibration part is just highlights the, the, the structure of the, of the wave along that, that line. Shift from a one-dimensional string to a two-dimensional drum head or a trampoline surface, if you like. You get that, that, that thing bouncing up and down. It's now, again, a standing wave. It's trapped. It's dancing in place, and now it's dancing. It's a surface dancing. So it's, it's a two-dimensional object that is undergoing a wave. The wave happens to go into the third dimension, which makes it easy to see. But, but basically, the wave is taking place along the surface, two dimensions. Is that OK? We could also, just to, to get, sort of get ahead, instead of having that surface bounce up and down and be a wave, we could make it cycle through colors. It would now be a flat surface that isn't moving up and down, but it's just cycling through colors in a, in a rhythmic manner. And you would also say it's, it's got a wave going on in it. We're not using the third dimension anymore. Just, this is me experimenting with a new way of thinking about this. Okay? So it's a two-dimensional wave with the waving going on strictly as colors. Well, how about a three-dimensional wave? This is the problem. If I have a three-dimensional wave going from a string to a surface, the next thing I got to go to is like a three-dimensional object that's got a wave on it. It's not going to be waving into the fourth dimension. We're out of dimensions. So we can't, we got nowhere to go. We have to use the color idea or something like it. It is undergoing a wave behavior, but it's not another motion into a, a, yet another dimension. It's, I've, I've illustrated just as, as, as a cycling through colors. So if you've got this three-dimensional wave, which might be a, a sort of a ball-shaped structure here, and the various parts of it are, going th are cycling through the colors. That's the wave process. It's trapped for some reason. In the case of an electron around an atom, the electron's pretty much trapped not by confinement from the outside, but attraction from the inside. It's got a positively charged nucleus there saying, you know, stick around, guy. Opposites attract. So the electron lives around that nucleus. It's got a structure, this wave st structure around the nucleus, and it's, it's, it's going through its cycles. The cycles of a wave. Crest, trough, crest, trough, crest, trough. But they might be through color. Red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. Is that all right? I mean, it's, it's terribly abstract, but it's, it's what it is. Toe? How does the amplitude of the wave affect the energy of the particle? The amplitude of the wave is related to the probability of finding the electron if you go looking for it. Uh, the, the probability of finding the electron actually is, is proportional to the square of that amplitude. The energy of the particle, which is what you ask. So, so, so if, if you've got this wave around here, and suppose the wave is strongest, the biggest amplitude in the, in the, in the center, that's where you're most likely to find it. 
okay? As you go farther out in the periphery, the amplitudes get tinier and tinier. It's cycling through red, red, red blue, but, but very dim, just a little bit of red, little blue. So that's where you're not gonna find the electron. It's most likely in the, toward the center. The energy comes about primarily because it shows up in the curvature of the wave function. Uh, that is how abruptly it goes from, from uh, high amplitude to low amplitude, for example. A wave function that is very broad and smooth like that corresponds to a very low energy uh, uh, item. Uh, if it goes very abruptly, like that, that terrible curvature in the wave function, it goes from nothing to a lot to a nothing. And so thinking spatially, it's, it, that's a curve. Hard, hard bend, hard bend in the amplitude. That's high energy. And that associated with that is, remember when I was looking for the, we, we got the, We've got the electron in, in, a, in, a, in a ball. Maybe now it's an, it's an electron around an atom in, in it, one of those orbitals, they're called, one of, the, one of these quantum standing waves. And if it's in the lowest energy quantum standing wave, it's very gradual, smooth uh, wave. If you go looking for the electron, you know, be a bad guy, and come in here and go looking. Where is it? I want to know. Bam, you discover it's right here, okay? It's within that little, that little section. You have changed the wave function from this lovely, gradual 1s quantum level to this nasty thing that isn't a simple orbital at all anymore. It's a little localized electron. It's here. With it, you, know, you can't say it's here to like a, 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 tiny, a point in space. It's here within my fingers. And now you've bent the wave function ferociously right there. It's here, but, it, but if you sort of scan across this, nothing, 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 nothing. Wow, big amplitude. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Okay, terrible bend, huge energy. So that electron now has been completely changed. It's got terribly high energy. It probably doesn't care at, at all about the nucleus of the, electro, of the uh, atom anymore. If you let time continue now, this thing is just going to go poof, just the, the wave now, because it's just packed full of energy and so bent, it will evolve in time very differently from the way the, the wave function evolved in time when it was this gradual thing around the nucleus, the 1s. The 1s electron doesn't evolve in time. It's, it stays the same. All it does is change colors in my world. Of, 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 it just dances in place. This guy, once you've localized it, doesn't dance in place anymore. It, it just explodes off in all kinds of directions. And so this is, this is the kind of thing, the, the sort of the atom smasher type idea. When people started going and looking for what, what it looked like to look into an atom and sort of pin down the parts, where are they located? When you do that, you crunch the wave functions down. You collapse them, throw away all the, all the, the stuff outside. You say it's here. And when you've done that, yes, you get a brief instant of, yep, it's here, and the next instant, Bam, you, you have smashed the atom. You've torn, up, torn it apart by messing with its, its quantum waves. Is that OK? I mean, it is what it is, but hopefully it sort of makes some vague sense at least. All right? Yeah, John? What about frequency and energy? Uh, for a single particle zipping along, whether it's light or anything else, it has a frequency to it. We've seen that light has a frequency, or radio waves have a frequency. You just sit in one place and you watch the, the crests go by. It turns out that the energy of that light, and of every particle, is proportional to that frequency. All of them. And the constant of proportionality is known as Planck's constant. It's, it's one of the things when in graduate school I knew it perfectly well. I can't remember. It's a, it's a tiny little thing. So the, the, the amount of energy in joules of one quantum of visible light is fantastically small. It's like 10 to the minus 19 joules. Uh, so the energy in, in something like a, like a quantum of light is typically not stated in joules, the, the metric unit. It's stated in, the, in another unit, which is the, the unit known as an, an electron volt. An electron volt is the energy that an electron, one or one, one electron or one positive charge, just to make life simpler, one, one positive charge would have if you move it from zero volts to one volt. It's the energy it takes to move, to move one, po one fundamental unit of positive charge across a one volt voltage difference. 
tiny little amount of energy. That's called one electron volt. Is that okay? And the, the energy in visible light photons, the little, little quanta of visible light, that is, that is if, you, if you take a, a red, uh, uh, the smallest portion of red light you can have, which is one quantum unit, uh, it carries with it around two electron volts. You should know better. That's my, you know, that's my original specialty is atomic physics and optical physics. So it's about two, two electron volts. For blue light, it's about, two, about three electron volts. It's in that, it's in that range. You know, a one, two, 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 three, four electron volts is the energy of visible light. It's also the energy of some of the wimpiest chemical bonds. Now, how much energy does it take to pull apart a, a molecule? To rip the pieces off. You know, start pull, typically, grab an, you grab any old piece of an organic molecule, the stuff that we're made of, and you yank the piece off, it usually takes you a couple of electron volts to pull it free of work to yank it off. So visible light has enough energy to go to after some of the weakest of the bonds and break them, uh, or, or barely. Uh, it, one of the reasons, OK, so, so, you know, so how do we see? We see because when visible light goes into our eyes, it has enough energy to rearrange some of the molecules in our retina. Uh, the mo I think the most famous one is rhodopsin. The, when the light is absorbed by a rhodopsin molecule, the rhodopsin molecule changes its, its conformation. It changes shape. It doesn't actually come apart. It just it, it rotates pieces of it. And that triggers nerve impulses. So visible light can just start to tinker with some molecules in us. If you go to higher frequencies, the ultraviolets, now ultraviolet can carry four, five, six, seven electron volts of energy. That's enough energy to begin breaking chemical bonds and to tear out, tear, in fact, in some cases, to tear an electron completely out of a molecule and throw it away, uh, which is known as ionization. So, so ultraviolet light and its higher energy relatives, like x-rays and gamma rays, those, those when they, when, when they, they travel as waves still, they're still electromagnetic waves, but when they're absorbed or emitted, they involve bigger chunks of energy. Bigger pho they're called photons. I mean, the official name for this is photons. Or, or generically, they're quanta of light. Anyhow, they, they can really rearrange molecules. And that's why exposing yourself to tons of ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays is not a great idea. They rearrange the molecules in you uh, in ways that were not, you know, nature didn't really intend. And so they can cause damage. You know, chem real chemical damage, and ultimately, you, this is part of the origins of some, in some cases of cancers. All right, so you okay with with the idea of, of frequency carries with it? Frequency is the hallmark of energy, and probably I've got a, I've got this somewhere. Nah, it's not the one I wanted. Nah, it's it's in there. Eventually, we'll get we'll get to that that, that relationship that the energy carried by a a quanta of anything, a quanta of light being the classic example, that that energy is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency. So the higher the frequency, the more energy it carries. All right? Well, so where do I want to go with this? Uh, in, in any generic atom, when you put an electron in that atom, and it, it, you haven't put too many so that, it's the ne that you now have a negatively charged thing, the electron wants to stay around the nucleus because it's attracted by the positive charge. And it tends to settle into uh, one of these standing waves, these quantum standing waves, what are called orbitals. They have the peculiarity that the electron is not localized orbiting the nucleus. That would be a high energy arrangement where you've, where you've pinned down the electron. Don't pin down the electron. Let it occupy the standing wave nicely, spread out. That's lower energy, but more, less curvature to the wave function. So they spread out, and the electrons in most atoms are simultaneously all around the atom. They may have some structure in their location, often do, but they're not point objects. They're not little planets. OK, so um, it, suppose you have a neon atom. And ne uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get there next graphic. Neon has 10 electrons. Why does it have 10 electrons? Because it's got 10 protons in its nu nucleus. And to become a, an electrically neutral atom, it naturally attracts 10 electrons. 
Any fewer, and it would still be positively charged and would attract another one. Any, any more electrons, it would become negatively charged and one would leave. Uh, there are, you, sometimes you can get one extra electron stuck on, a, on an atom, at least temporarily, but mostly they like to become neutral. So the, the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom is, gives the destiny of that atom. It says what that atom's going to hit. The number of protons determines how many electrons the atom will have. The number of electrons, in turn, determines the chemistry of the, of the, of the atom. All the chemistry takes place way outside the nucleus in the world of the electrons talking to each other. And so um, what makes gold gold chemically is its electrons. What makes gold have the right number of electrons is the number of positive charges in its nucleus. So the, the old alchemist's dream of turning one element into, into another, they had to finally go down. In, they, didn't know, they didn't know what they were doing. But they would have had to go to the nucleus of the atom, muck around with the number of protons there, and cause the atom to change the number of electrons it, it attracted to become the new element. Uh, naturally, they, they couldn't do this. All they could play with was the electrons on the outside. And that didn't change the nucleus. OK, so neon, 10 positive charges in its nucleus. Therefore, it has 10 electrons when, it's, when you just let it sit there. Where do those electrons go? Well, they go into these quantum standing waves, again, the orbitals. And why don't they all just pile up in the lowest energy orbital? I should say, the, the different orbitals have different energies. The more curvature there is in the wave function, in the shape of that orbital, the more bent it is. And also, the farther it is away from the positively charged nucleus, which is very attractive to the electrons. Those two things, more curvature, more distance, means, means higher energy. So there are different orbitals, just as there are different ways that a, a string can vibrate. I showed you I showed you it can go as one string like this, or as two half strings. I think I got a little bit of three, three one-third strings going. They have different frequencies, each of those. The same thing is true of our orbitals. They're, the lowest energy orbital is the one that's in closest to that positive charge and is the most smooth, broad thing possible. As you go to orbitals that are farther away from the nucleus and have structure in them. For example, they, they, they change, a change sign in crossing the midpoint and become two lobes. I, showed you, I did show you that. These kind of orbitals that, have a, that, that, change, um, that, that, that change sign and have a, have a surface where there's no amplitude, that's, that's that surface. No amplitude is called a node. That's, that introduces more energy. Um, in, in the orbital. So lots of different orbitals. Each one has its own energy. Associated with that energy is, is a frequency. These, are, these ones down here, these are higher frequency. They, go, they cycle faster through their colors in my pictures uh, because they have more energy. Anyway, you've know, we, we've, we've talked all, uh, frequently, I've talked frequently, about the fact that things like to get rid of potential energy. So given their choice, the electrons in neon, every last one of them, all 10, would, would shuttle down to the lowest energy orbital they could be in and stay there. They'd love that. They can't. And the reason they can't is because of a, a one char a characteristic of nature, which is that no two identical, what are called Fermi particles, which includes electrons, can ever occupy the same quantum wave. So if you have two electrons that you cannot tell apart, and electrons have the ability to be truly identical in a way that's sort of beyond what you can sort of think. We're not talking like, like two coffee mugs that have the same silly cartoon on them. These, these two electrons of, of, the, of the same spin, both spin up, are truly indistinguishable to the point where they're, they're interchangeable in a bizarre way. They really, really, really can't tell them apart. And if that's the case, you can't tell them apart, they cannot sh share the same wave. If one's in that wave already, the other one absolutely cannot be in that wave. And as a result, you can't have all 10 electrons in the neon atom piled up in the lowest orbital, forbidden by nature. Uh, you can actually have two of them in that orbital. Why? Because there are two distinguishable states of an electron. One of them we can call spin up, and one of them called spin down. And associated with spin, this is this angular momentum, remember angular momentum? This is, this is in there. So two electrons of opposite angular momentum can occupy the same orbital. But then that orbital is done. It's full. 
the next two electrons have to go in a higher orbit, in another orbital. Higher, higher is jargon for more energy. Uh, there are orbitals, there are cases where there are two orbitals that are different, but you know, two different ways, but they have exactly the same energy. So higher is a little bit overstatement, but and furthermore, it's a re reference to higher in energy. So anyway, to, to, to create a neon atom, you pile up the electrons in five different orbitals. And once you've done that, uh, neon is happy and stable. It's also very inert. When the, the way you fill those orbitals up and, and, and uh, arrange them, the next electron you would put into them goes into a much higher energy orbital, or would go into a much higher energy orbital. You've kind of finished off a structure that uh, makes the neon atom very content. It doesn't want more electrons. It certainly doesn't want to give up an electron. It doesn't want to have anything to do with anybody anymore. And so it's what's known as a noble gas. Uh, it's relatively chemically unreactive. You, you, know, you basically can't do a thing with it. It just, it just tootles around. You're breathing them all the time now, those little neon atoms. They go in and out. Pff, they do nothing. They're boring. Except when you run electricity through them. So they're, now, we, when we run electricity through a, through a vapor of, of, uh, of neon atoms, we're smacking those little neon atoms with electrons and, and other charged particles in this discharge. We put a couple of charges in there. We started yanking them up and down with electric fields, and they're now being smacked into each other. What's happening here is the impacts of, between the charged particles and other little projectiles whizzing around in that neon are taking electrons that were in this wonderfully content little neon atom and knocking them into orbitals they had not meant to be in. That's an action that takes energy, and it came out of the collision energies of the particles, which originated in the electric fields, and therefore in the power support source here. But once you get one of the electrons in, one, in the neon, uh, in a neon atom into a high, into an excited orbital, an orbital that it would not normally be in, and, and which it can leave and give up energy in the process. Now, it can, it can leave and give up energy in the process. So we've knocked electrons. I, I should be able to figure out what the orbitals are, but, but I, the details don't matter. The electron is temporarily, briefly, in one of those excited orbitals. It then, again, trying to give up energy as quickly as it can, it drops back into one of the original orbitals. So it goes from one standing wave created by the impact to back to its original standing wave, or at least one en route to its original standing wave. And in the process, it gives up energy, because it, it's going from a, a high energy orbital, that is one typically that is farther from the nucleus, uh, and therefore work had to be d done to pull it out, and also more curved, so it has more energy associated with that curvature. And it goes from that to one that's in closer, less curved, where did the energy go? It comes out as light. So we're seeing light come out corresponding to the energy differences between orbitals within the neon atom. And we can look at that light through this camera. This camera is, I've got to remember which camera it is. Is that it? No. It's the weird one. Come on. Yes, it's it. All right. You are looking at the neon tube. <laughs> Woo! See? Here, this is me. You're looking through a diffraction grating. A, 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 that is a bunch of slits that create interference effects. We, we're taking the waves, cracking them into pieces, and seeing whether they overlap properly. Once you crack them apart, we get constructive interference, destructive. And the result is that diffraction grating picks out each frequency emitted by this, by this uh, lamp, discharge lamp, uh, arrives at a certain horizontal location along that sweep of colors. I can dim the lights here so you can, so you can see it better. This, this is the spectrum of colors being emitted by that neon lamp. If this were a, an incandescent light source, that is a hot object, a candle, a tungsten filament, it would be continuous. All the colors would be represented with different intensities. 
Because this neon lamp is emitting light only corresponding to specific orbital to orbital transitions and the energy steps required to make those transitions, you only see very specific colors. Now, uh, this is the, the brightest. This is the, the, ma the main red line is right there. Um, it's 630 nanometers, give or take. But there are also some yellows. There are even some greens and stuff around here. Otherwise, it's pretty, it's pretty sparse. OK, those are the wavelengths associated with neon. And they're characteristic of the neon atom. If I change to a different, to a different atom, let me go over to helium. So this is helium now. Same idea. Helium, helium only has two electrons, and its orbitals are somewhat different. And it has a much sparser spectrum. Not as, it's just simply not as complicated because it doesn't have, can I get this to shift over here? That's mostly, mostly some blues. All right. The origin of that spectrum is in the structure of the atom, is its particular orbitals, and a little bit in, in which orbitals get excited by the impacts, and then the, the sequence of, of steps from excited orbitals down to the to return to where you started from. All right? So to, to have this happen, we had the, you know, the structure of atoms. The, the, the electrons are all in these orbitals. When, when, at least when, when it's left alone, nobody's playing with it. The electrons are in the orbitals, two electrons per orbital at maximum. And the electrons just sit there in their little waves, dancing away. OK. Uh, there's a little bit about the discharge itself, which is not so important for the moment. And I want to get to somewhere. OK, so this, this I've got so many lights on now, I can't see myself. This is that formula I went looking for earlier, that the energy in a photon, or actually in any quantum excitation, is simply the product of two things. The famous Planck constant, which is maybe new to you, not that famous, and frequency. So in this spectrum that you still see up here from, from uh, helium, we're get, over here on the left, this is the highest frequency uh, of light coming off that, that helium. Uh, it's got the highest energy per particle, therefore. And then we work our way down. And this is somewhere in the blue green or it's not, you know, some, some colors. All right. Well, where this goes, I don't want to do this. Let me show you one more spectrum. And then I want to, this, this is mercury. And mercury is very sparse. Almost nothing here in the visible. There's one, this one purpley line. It's not very bright. What you can't see is there is a very, very intense line in the ultraviolet. Um, it's out here somewhere on, this, on the screen. You, you won't know it's there. Can I, can I make it visible with, if I hold these guys up there, we'll, no. It, it, it may not actually get out of the tube. Glass tends to absorb that, that light. It's at 243 nanometers. Uh, I spent way too long accidentally looking at mercury light when I was a graduate student. Uh, <laughs> cooked my, the lenses in my eyes. Not a good idea. Um, what's the point here? The point is a fluorescent lamp, which I can show you. This is a conventional fluorescent lamp. This is one without that powder on it. Remember I asked you a question last time about, about the powder in a fluorescent lamp. What if you got rid of it? In a normal tube, you get this white glow from the powder on the inside of the tube. In a lamp with no powder, you get that really dim blue. That's the same blue you saw a minute ago on that, uh, up on the screen as the glow from a mercury, lamp, mercury discharge. It's, it's, th it's this one, right? Nothing very useful. All right? Why the difference? 
Well, the powder is doing something very interesting. The powder is taking the ultraviolet light produced by mercury atoms when you smack them. It's not useful by itself. It's, it's, it, we don't see it. It's taking that light, and the energy associated with each photon of that light, the, phos the phosphor is absorbing that, that pa those packets of energy, throwing out a little bit of that energy, and using the rest to synthesize a new particle of light, one that's invisible. So this is the process known as fluorescence. And this is an ultraviolet flashlight. It, right? You can barely see it. Right? It's, it's near ultraviolet. It's, your eyes can just sort of notice it. But when we shine it onto the, this kind of stuff, this fluorescent stuff, the fl this flashlight has no orange light in it. And yet, look, orange. Oh, wake up, guy. Where's the orange coming from? It's being created for the first time by the chemical that's there. That chemical, that familiar orange chemical, it's way too familiar to me, too, from my graduate school days, is rhodamine is the name of this chemical. And it, so is that. It absorbs the ultraviolet light and re-emits it as a new color with less energy per particle. So it always is lower in frequency. It takes the very high frequency ultraviolet light and re-emits it, in this case, as about, uh, you know, it's the 600 nanometers light. It's going from, from 400 nanometer high energy light to 600 nanometer lower energy light and re-emitting it. So all these neon clothes that, you're, that you guys frequently have, particularly during the summer, all the beach wear and stuff, it's covered, those are covered with molecules that take ultraviolet light in, chop off some of the energy, throw it away as heat, thermal energy, and re-emit the rest as visible light. Uh, that's true also of white, do I have, you can't really tell here, uh, white clothing, certainly white paper, you know, what's that, that blue glow you see there? That's not accidental. They put into paper and into white clothing, they put fluorescent dyes that emit blue so that when you shine ultraviolet light on the, on the stuff, it glows blue and that makes, you, makes it look brighter. Um, the history of this is, is clothing with age, white clothing with age and, and sheets and stuff turns yellow. You've all noticed this and you find, old, find ancient linens and they're kind of yellow. They start absorbing blue light is what happens with, 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 with age and damage. And by putting this blue fluorescent chemical on it, you know, bleach borax and brighteners, brighteners, brighteners are those blue, glow, blue fluorescent materials. They glow blue, and they replace the missing blue that's, that's, that shows up because of uh, aging in the, in the fabric. So um, the, the, the point of all this stuff, to finish off fluorescent lamps, and so I can go on to something different next time. This fluorescent lamp takes the ultraviolet light that's emitted by a mercury spectrum. So this is a mercury discharge, uh, and it is almost all ultraviolet light. It's useless by itself. But that light hits the phosphor on the inside of the tube, and the phosphor takes that, the photons of ultraviolet light, chops them up, and re-emits them as visible portions of light. And depending on the exact chemicals they use in that fluorescent tube, they can make it emit daylight color, like, like sunlight, or they can make it uh, warm, warm red. Warm, there's a name for it, warm white or something like that. That, that looks more like the, the glow from an incandescent light bulb. They can synth they're synthesizing the colors that they want. So these different lamps, they're all slightly different colors. Uh, it used to be a big deal I would talk about, about at length about when you buy fluorescence. You, know, you pick your color temperature to, to, according to feel. You can still do that. It's, they're, they're fading. It's becoming LEDs with color temperature. But the point of this is they're synthesizing that white strategically using different chemicals that, that fluoresce when they hit with ultraviolet light. And that's the story of fluorescence. And what I have to talk about next and last is the high pressure discharge lamps. This is a mercury lamp again, different because it's high pressure, and sodium vapor, which is a bright yellow, will we'll come to that. All right, see you on Wednesday.